located in Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today. We know that you will be blessed. To learn more about the House of God, visit us online at www.houseofgod.org. Be blessed.
Greetings to each of you today. We're thankful to God for uh, being able to be before you again on a beautiful uh, Sabbath day. We thank God for His grace, His mercy, and all the things that He is to each and every one of us every day. We feel so blessed to have the opportunity to speak with you. I want to greet all of you today, all of the members of the House of God, uh, churches here in the U.S. and around the world, wherever we have churches. We greet all of our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We certainly want to welcome all of you that may not be members of the House of God, but may be sharing with us today uh, in this service. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you taking the time to, to be a part of our uh, format here, our, our virtual format. We thank God for you. Uh, you have a lot, of, a lot of places you could be tuning into and a lot of ministries that you could be watching. So I do thank you today for taking the time to spend with us. I uh, thank God for all things. And I, I want to continue our discussion. We've been discussing the subject matter. It's time to press for the last several weeks. Uh, from Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 14, uh, Paul's discourse there concerning his determination uh, to make the resurrection of the dead uh, for those who have died in Christ. And he says that he presses toward the mark uh, for the prize, for the high calling in Christ Jesus, uh, not letting anything uh, deter him uh, from that goal. And uh, we've been talking about that. Last week I, I talked about Joshua after the death of Moses and, and how God encouraged him and assured him that he would be with him as he was with Moses. But he charged him uh, to be very courageous and to be very uh, persistent. He also instructed him to meditate uh, in the book of the law, to meditate uh, to focus on that and to spend time day and night uh, not deviating from it but digesting it and using it as a means of being in compliance with God's word. That was a, a press for him uh, that he had to keep his eye on a prize. Looking at Paul today uh, and understanding what he was really talking about in Philippians chapter chapter 3, caused me to think uh, concerning the resurrection uh, that we talk about so much. Paul has given us some glorious writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and, and 1 Thessalonians. He, he's given us just some, some very inspirational writing uh, concerning uh, the resurrection of the dead. He paints a picture for us in very vivid ways to talk about what will happen when Christ returns. And those of us uh, that uh, recognize our mortality appreciate even the more uh, Paul's writing, his very graphic description of what happens uh, at the resurrection. It is a mystery, and he classifies it as a mystery. He, he says, I show you a mystery in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he says that we should not all sleep, meaning that there will be those that will be alive uh, when our Lord returns. But he talks about the dead in Christ uh, rising and taking on immortality uh, with a different body that's not subject to the ills and conditions that we face today. For all of us that are believers, these are just glorious, wonderful scriptures that encourage us so much. We use them uh, many times at funerals uh, to encourage the living uh, concerning the fate of the dead that die in Christ. Uh, we use them at times when we're trying to uh, show that there is life after this life. And we use those and, and encourage and motivate uh, our brothers and sisters and give them hope. 
But I think as ministers, uh, sometimes we do people an injustice. And so many of us that stand in places where I stand and minister to others and encourage others and, and to try to get people to see uh, what glorious things God has in store for us. But I think many times we do, we do an injustice to people because we show one side of the resurrection and we don't show the other. And so many times we give people uh, false hope False hope. And when I say false hope, uh, we don't show them the other side of God. Uh, we show them the merciful side. We show them the gracious side. We show them the side that points to immortality with God and everlasting life. And, and we show them the, the new heaven and new earth. And we show them all the the, the wonderful things that, that are written in the scriptures concerning what happens uh, to those that die in Christ. But there's another side to this that I think we need to devote some time to. Because I think it is that side of this that really motivated Paul in Philippians chapter 3 to make the statements concerning it by any means, whatever it takes, I must make the resurrection of the dead. And I started to think, I've been wrestling with these scriptures and trying to get into Paul's head as to what uh, was really the motivation behind him making these statements. He, he certainly recognized his mortality. There's no question about that. When I look at 1 Corinthians 15, it lets me know that he recognizes his mortality. And when I look at his writings in Thessalonians, I said, yep, he really did realize that this, this body one day is going to deteriorate. And he recognized that in, in order for him to make the resurrection of the dead uh, with Christ, that he had to have a certain lifestyle. So I think he recognized that. But the other side that I think really motivated Paul is what happened for those that die outside of Christ there is a resurrection for them too and we don't talk about that one much we talk about the one uh, pertaining to those that die in Christ but in, in Revelation chapter 20 we get a glimpse not a glimpse more than a glimpse we get some details on the other resurrection. And we need to think about that. As ministers, as preachers, as pastors, uh, as evangelists, as missionaries, as those that, that encourage people to accept Christ, we need to take a look at that resurrection. Because when we read Revelation, what we see is we see a, a resurrection of those that have died in Christ. And we see how that works and, and, and the bliss of that resurrection. And following that, we find a, a glorious time that we love to talk about uh, when the devil is bound for a thousand years and, and, and the saints are able to live their lives without the influence or the interference of the devil but then we find that and we can read this in Revelation chapter 20 we find that there is another uh, another resurrection in, in, in Revelation 20 uh, looking at verse 10 it says and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I want you to think about that as we look at the, the 
next resurrection or the second resurrection. The second resurrection is really defined and described in Revelation chapter 20 beginning at verse 11. And John says this, he said, I saw a great white throne. That's verse 11 of Revelation 20. He says, I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place for them. Now here's the piece that I think you need to pay attention to. In verse 12, he says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. Now this is interesting because what John saw was the dead, great, small, stand before God. Didn't matter whether you were a common, everyday person or you were a affluent, wealthy person, John says he saw the dead stand before God. In verse, in, in, in verse 12, and he talks about the books that were opened. He says, I saw the dead, great and small, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now that reminds me of what Jeremiah uh, wrote in chapter 17, looking at verses 8 and 9, when he talked about the heart of man. The, the thoughts of man. And he says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then he goes on to say, I the Lord search the heart, try the reins. And then he says something interesting. He says, even to give unto every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. That parallels here very closely to what John writes in Revelation chapter 20. Because looking at the nature of God, all of us are going to be accountable for our actions, for our deeds, for what we do, what we say, all the things that have been a part of our lives. God makes us accountable. So we look at Revelation chapter 20 and, and it, it says this in verse 13. I'm continuing the reading. He says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their work. Most of us don't think about that. We really don't. This is why repentance is so important. This is why reconciliation uh, through the blood of Jesus is so important. This is why Asking for forgiveness of our sins is so important because we, there's a time coming when we will be held accountable for our deeds. And we must be reconciled through the blood of Christ. 
So because you don't talk about it, because you think God has forgotten about it, because you've never repented of your sins, because you never acknowledged your wickedness, because you've never confessed your sins, your sins are still on you. And this is what Revelation is pointing to when it talks about them being judged according to their works. And the books were open. The books were open. There's a record. There is a record being kept on you and I. God is fair. And he is not, he is not insensitive to us. But there is a record. Now, it said that the sea gave up the dead which were in it. I want you to think about that. All the people that have died, that have drowned, through the ages, drowned in the ocean, drowned in the rivers, drowned in the seas of the world. It says that the seas would give up their dead. They would give them up, death and hell, the grave, whatever cemetery you might be buried in. And we usually have a choice of cemeteries where we want to be buried, graveyards that we like, and we go visit and look and see if we think we want that, we want that cemetery or uh, to be the one where we're buried in the grave, death, and hell, wherever death found you, you may not be in a cemetery. You may not even have a grave. There may not be any place that, that, that people can identify where your remains are. Doesn't really matter. The resurrection comes, God will find you. You will be resurrected. And I'm talking about not the resurrection of the righteous. I'm talking about the resurrection of the unrighteous. Not the resurrection that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. When the dead in Christ rise, the holy folks rise. I'm not talking about that one. This one will be made up of every description of sinner. Liars, cheaters, thieves, some of the worst characters that we can name, deceivers, murderers, you name it, whatever it is that's sinful, this resurrection will be for them and for me. If I'm, if I'm in that category. And for you, if you're in that category. For all of the unforgiven sins, all of the sins that you committed, that you thought God had forgotten about, you never repented of them, you never said I was sorry, you never confessed your sins, you never acknowledged your sins. You say, but, but I'm in Christ. You're in Christ, yes. You've accepted Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, as your Redeemer. But I would remind you that when Jesus instructed in the prayer in Matthew 6, he urged us to be aware and to ask forgiveness. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our transgressions. That is not a one-time forgiveness and everything is all right. Every day we need to be aware of things that separate us from God and repent and turn and change from our wicked ways, from our evil thoughts and ask God to forgive us of our transgressions for this day, whatever the situation is. Sometimes we think, oh, I accepted Christ 25 years ago. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. You haven't prayed a prayer since then. You haven't devoted your life to Christ. You haven't changed your lifestyle. You're still acting like you're a sinner. What makes you think that God is not going to hold you accountable for your actions? For the things that you've done. You've told lies. 
Did you ever repent? Did you ever ask God to forgive you? So when you look at Revelation 13, uh, chapter 20, and we look at verse, verse 13, nobody gets away. This is the resurrection for the unholy. In verse 14, Revelation 20, it says, and Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Interesting. The second death. The second death. You died once. That was a natural death. This is the second. This is the second resurrection. In verse 15. And, who, and whosoever is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Now, we speak of God's mercy so much and sometimes we omit telling people this. It is important to tell people this. Not every day, not every time you're in the pulpit, not every time you're witnessing, but we need to remind folks that there is, there is another resurrection. There is a resurrection that results in people being cast into the lake of fire. It is much, it's as much a part of the plan of God as is what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 and and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's, it's as much a part of it as that is. And if we fail, if we as ministers fail to show this side of God, you say, well, I don't, I, I, I don't believe that. Well, what has happened, what has happened to so many of us is is that the plan of salvation becomes so subjective to what we think and what we believe and what we see and what we understand until we forget that God is the author and finisher of our faith. And the plan of salvation is based on his rules, his guidelines. Let me read something else uh, here. I want you to think about this as well. In Revelations 20, I want to read this verse again for emphasis. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now I don't know where your theological thoughts are, your biblical thoughts are, I have no idea where some of you, uh, what some of you think about this. Uh, there, there are different thoughts on what happens, what happens to me, or what will happen to you in the second resurrection. When he talks about the lake of fire, where the devil, the false prophet, the beast are tormented day and night, forever and ever. Have you ever thought about what forever and ever is? Have you ever thought about, have you ever thought about what eternity is? 
Have you ever thought about something that has no beginning, uh, uh, no ending? Eternity? This lake of fire in, in verse 10 is the same lake of fire that's referenced in verse 15. And in verse 15, it's talking about those that were raised whose names were not in the Lamb's book of life. Unrepentant sin, unforgiven sin, unacceptable lifestyle that were not a part of the first resurrection where the dead in Christ were raised first. This resurrection, according to Revelation, occurs a thousand years after the first resurrection. And in this resurrection, the sea, the earth, wherever the remains are, they're resurrected. But I want you to pay attention. The fate of the devil, the fate of the beast, the fate of the false prophet was that they were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. We as ministers don't talk about this a lot. We're living in the age of feel-good ministry. Everybody is being made to feel okay. And we have the message of God's mercy, God's grace, God's patience, God's long-suffering, God loves you, God loves you. Yes, he does. But for those that refuse to accept his love, that refuse to accept his spirit, that refuse to accept his lifestyle, that refuse to accept his goodness through the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of humanity, he has a place for us. He has a place for you. We don't talk about it because it makes people uncomfortable. And we become so subjective until we start looking at other people. Well, I'm better than him. I'm better than her. I'm better than those. I'm, I'm living a lifestyle. I, I don't believe God would do that. It isn't about what you believe about God. It's about what the Bible says about him. Sometimes we forget that. And we do people a misservice. We do them an injustice. Somebody needs a Samuel in your life, like David had. Somebody needs a Samuel in your life to say, look, that's wrong. Your lifestyle is wrong. You've transgressed against God's law. You have transgressed against the God that loves you. You've sinned. Somebody needs to tell someone else that and avoid what we're talking about here today because if you believe the Bible, if you believe the, you believe the whole Bible, some of us believe some parts and throw out other parts. This that I'm reading today, I feel is a motivation that Paul had in Philippians chapter 3. By whatever means it takes, I must make the resurrection of the dead. Now what he did not say, I must make that first resurrection. That's the one he was interested in. That's the one that he had to make. That's the one that he was pressing to be a part of. That's the one that had the mark that he was looking for. The high calling in Christ Jesus making that resurrection. How glorious it will be. But that's not the only resurrection. And I'm saying to you, when I look at these scriptures and I look at what happened with the devil, with the beast, with the false prophet that was placed in the, the, the lake of fire and brimstone and was tormented day and night. Let me get back to what I was saying. I don't know what you think. 
Some people say, oh, I don't believe, I don't believe God would torment me. Uh, I don't believe that he'd have a place of torment for, for human beings. He's a loving and merciful God. Yes, he is. That's why he came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ and sacrificed himself for your sins and mine. And he says in his discourse to Nicodemus in, in John chapter 16, he says that, 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 that he that fails to, to recognize, to accept Christ is condemned already. That's a loving God saying. But if you don't accept what I have for you, you're condemned already. So I think we need to start thinking a little differently about, about God. And, 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 and how insulted he is when we fail to accept his righteousness and how offended he is when we fail to accept his crucifixion and, and how, how hurt he is when we ignore him because of our own thoughts and our own will. He says in the prayer, not my will but thy will, all right? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Not my will, not because of the way I see it. How does God see it? So in this text, in verse 15, the devil, the false prophet, and the beast were placed in the lake of fire. And they were tormented day and night forever. That's the lake of fire. That's where they are, or that's where they will be. What is so interesting, when I look at this, when the books were open, when the judgment, the white throne judgment took place, when all the dead for, for, since the existence of humanity stood before God, the sea gave up its dead, and all of that happened. But I want you to look at verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Think about that. Well, the lake of fire is the same place that is identified in verse 10. Loving, merciful God. Yes. Verse 10 says that if your name was not written in the book, in the Lamb's book, you were cast into the lake of fire where the beast, the false prophet, and the devil were. And in there, that is a place of perpetual torment. Perpetual torment. Not torment for a day. Not torment for two days. Not torment for a month. Not torment for a year. It is a place of perpetual, everlasting torment, day and night, forever and ever and ever. Think about it. That place is the fate of those that are part of the second resurrection. Now, we as preachers don't talk about this much because we like to make people feel good. And we like to make everybody leave, feel, leave feeling warm and fuzzy and all accepted and, oh, God loves you and God's going to bless you. And, yep, he's all of that. But for those that refuse to accept his grace, accept his goodness, accept his love, accept his sacrifice, for those that refuse to accept that, after so long a time of extending his mercy and extending his grace, refusing to accept his sacrifice and be reconciled through his blood, he has a plan for that too. 
He has a plan for that too. I feel that that is a motivation for Paul's pressing. Whatever it takes, whatever bad things I must endure, whatever persecution I must endure, I must make the resurrection of the dead because the alternative to that resurrection is a resurrection that will lead to torment, alienation from God. I can't pray there. I'll be tormented. Now, some people don't like this kind of preaching because they say, well, I, listen, you're going to frighten people off. No, I'm not going to frighten people off. It should make you run to Christ. Because there's no remedy for this but the blood of Jesus. There's no remedy for this but the godly lifestyle that God proclaims. Jesus spent time with it. Love your enemies. Do good to those that despite for lose you. Breast are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. All of those things are part of the lifestyle that will lead us to everlasting life with God and avoid eternal damnation and torment and separation from God. What was Paul's motivation? What caused him to press is the same thing that should cause me to press. The same thing that should cause you to press. The same thing. Listen, the Bible says we get three score and ten. 70 years. By reasonable strength, we get four score, and some get a little bit beyond that. Some of us have already reached three score. Some of us have reached three score and ten and have not come to the place to realize if I don't make that first resurrection, if I don't make the one that that that, that Paul says the dead in Christ will rise first. If I don't make that one, I'm a part of the one that comes a thousand years after. It's too late to pray. It's too late. God gave you four score and uh, three score and ten, or four score, or ninety years, a hundred years. He's given you all the time. I must make the resurrection of the dead. Whatever it takes, I can take it. And I understand that there's no condition in life where the love of God does not extend to me. That's what Paul meant. When he talked about nothing can separate us from the love of God. We sing these songs that make us feel good holding his hand. You're not holding his hand. He's holding yours. There are times when you don't have the strength to hold his. He must hold your hand to keep you from falling. It's time to press. It's time to press. Some of us are in the fourth decade. It's time to press. I've buried so many people in the fourth decade. It's time to press. Some of you are in the fifth decade. I've buried so many people that were in the fifth decade. Uh, some of you are in the second decade. I've buried people that were in that one too. And my question always is, uh, when I do the eulogy and when I do the committal and, and when I commend the Spirit to God and commit the body to the ground, I, I said, but did they know Jesus Christ in the pardoning of their sins? I had no power. I had no authority. Did they press? My question to you today, which resurrection are you going to be in? Which one are you going to be in? And if you're not sure that you are destined for the first resurrection, you need to press. It's time to press. COVID-19 has taken some out of here at a very early age. It's time to press. Accidents have taken some of us out at a very early age. It's time to press. Sickness and cancer and disease have taken some of us out of here uh, well before we thought we'd go. It's time to press. Paul recognized the second resurrection and was determined by whatever means 
I must make that first one. I must be in the one when the, when the trump sounds and the dead in Christ rise first. I must be in that resurrection. Because the other one is a resurrection of damnation destined to eternal torment. Yeah, theologians have a lot of things to say about this. And preachers have a lot of things to say about this. But when I look at a verse that describes the lake of fire where the beast, the false prophet, and the devil is, and they are tormented night and day. And I look down at verse 15 for all of us that that don't make that resurrection, and it says, and whosoever is not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. That's the same lake. If they're tormented day and night, I'm going to be tormented in day and night. You say, well, how how do you know that? Well, I've taken on a different body. I've taken on a different body. We talk about the glorified body, but then when we come, when, when it comes to this next body, it's got some uniqueness about it too. What is torment? We always think about torment. Yeah, you know, I'll be in the, in the lake of fire. Ah, uh, it may not be all the lake of fire. It may be your consciousness that torments you day and night. Your thoughts that torment you day and night. Your regrets that torment you day and night. But it's too late to make a change. It may be your physical body that is tormented by the pain, tormented by the agony of the lake of fire and brimstone. Ah, the torment that never ends. It's forever and ever. Paul recognized that. Because of that, He says, it's time to press for the mark, for the prize, for the high calling in Christ Jesus. And that high calling is making that first resurrection when our Lord and Savior returns. I thank you very much for your viewing today. I'm coming back to this. I'm not done with this because I think as ministers, we have been negligent. And not warning people about what is to come. What is to come. Yes, we go through all the end time prophecies. This is the ultimate end time prophecy. The ultimate end time message for all of us. We will revisit it until the Lord turns me loose from it. Because I think it's imperative for all of us to give consideration to eternity and what eternity means for you. And these resurrections are the ultimate expression of eternity for believers and unbelievers. I pray today for each of you uh, that you will think about what we've talked about today. And I will be talking about this uh, for a while. Because I think Paul had it right. Whatever it takes, you want to make that first resurrection. Father, we thank you today for this time that you've given us to share. This time that you've given us to address this important subject. And Father, I ask for the Holy Spirit to kindle someone's thoughts about their future, eternity, and what that looks like for them. I ask God that you would continue to touch, draw men and women to you as you said in your word. I thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless each of you.